everyone. How are you today? Nick, welcome back. Good to see you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you again. I'd like to start out today by introducing you to a colleague of mine. I assume by now many of you have been over to the U.S. Diplomacy Center, which is over on the 23rd Street side, that beautiful building over there, which is meant to eventually house a lot of uh, historical items. Uh, about the State Department and the work that we do here. I'd like to introduce you uh, this afternoon to Dr. Allison Mann. She's the public historian at the Diplomacy Center. So think about all the interesting stuff that she gets to learn about and research uh, in line with her job. Uh, she's here today to talk about American, African American History Month and an event that is taking place at the Diplomacy Center tomorrow. It is open press, so we'd like to invite you. And uh, Dr. Mann is going to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about it, take a few questions if you have questions, and then I'll take over from there. Uh, Dr. Mango, right ahead. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Heather, for uh, giving us the opportunity to present this exciting event to you. So just a little background about the Diplomacy Center. We are located at the State Department's 21st Street entrance. And the United States Diplomacy Center will be the first museum and education center dedicated to telling the story of American diplomacy, the history of American foreign policy, and illustrating the importance of American diplomacy for our nation's security and economic prosperity. Through exhibits and artifacts, we aim to inspire our visitors to explore the history, practice, impact, and challenges of diplomacy, and to honor our nation's diplomats. The center is made possible through public-private partnerships, which raise private funds in support of the center's construction, programs, and exhibits. Some exhibits will be open to the public in late 2019. And in the meantime, we're actively engaged with the American public through our education programs, social media outreach, and public programs. Tomorrow, on the 200th anniversary of Frederick Douglass' birth, we are delighted to present a program commemorating two of our nation's first African-American diplomats, Ebenezer Bassett and Frederick Douglass. Next slide, please. I have pictures. Um, in this lithograph behind me, this is from 1883. It's titled Distinguished Colored Men. And in the period after the Civil War, African American intellectuals entered high level positions in the federal government, serving as senators and gover governors, congressmen, and U.S. ministers. Back then, they weren't referred to as ambassadors, they referred to them as ministers. And please note Douglas in the center. He's probably recognizable to you. Ebenezer Bassett is below, and he's surrounded by many more accomplished men, um, former enslaved African Americans, the first graduate from Harvard, abolitionists, and writers. Next slide, please. This is a photograph of Ebenezer Don Carlos Bassett, our nation's first African American diplomat. Um, he was born in Connecticut. He studied at the Connecticut Normal School, and he also did pursue classes at Yale. And he was a scholar and educator, also an abolitionist, but he was also an internationalist. And he was appointed by President Grant as Minister to Haiti in 1868. He was already then fluent in French. And the U.S. had established diplomatic ties uh, with Haiti in the midst of the Civil War in 1862. And you may say, oh, well, that was coinciding with the Emancipation Proclamation. So he was not the first uh, minister to go to Haiti, but he, was, uh, he went there in 1868. Next slide, please. We'll also have two panelists speaking with me at the event tomorrow. This is Christopher Teal. He is a career foreign service officer. He's an expert on Ebenezer Bassett. And this is a picture of him talking at Yale University about the research that he's done. He published a book on Ebenezer Bassett called Heroes of Hispaniola. And he is currently doing a documentary about the life of Ebenezer Bassett. Next slide, please. And have you ever been across the river to Anacostia to Frederick Douglass's home? Some of you have. Um, this parlor is very interesting. Um, Frederick Douglass became minister to Haiti in 1889. He spent two years there. And his interaction with the Haitian people, he developed a great love for them and their culture. And you can very much see this in the Douglass house when you go. The wallpaper is Haitian inspired. And there are several artifacts there um, that also talked about Frederick's time in Haiti. So it's really interesting to go visit. It's operated by the National Park Service. And they are partnering with, with us on this event. So that will be our third speaker that we'll have there tomorrow. And the final slide, please. This is one of the exciting things that you'll be able to see. Um, some of the items belonging to Frederick Douglass. This was the pen 
Panama hat that he wore when he was in Haiti and brought back with him. So we'll have a few more items for folks to look at. So please do, if you can, join us tomorrow as we commemorate the diplomatic service of these very two distinguished African Americans. And I also wanted to mention that we have a new exhibit. It's just being uh, installed today about jazz diplomacy. And uh, several prominent African American musicians engaged in jazz diplomacy, particularly during the Cold War. And so they'll be featured there as well. And if you'd like a tour of that, um, please do contact us at diplomacycenter at state.gov if you're interested in looking at the exhibit. So thank you for your time. And I'll take a couple of questions. It's fascinating. Thank you so much. Well, thank uh, you. Could you explain a little bit more about jazz diplomacy and what that event is about? Yes. Uh, so jazz diplomacy was uh, musicians who the State Department, they're citizen diplomats, essentially. And so they were going over into Soviet bloc countries. It was soft diplomacy, you know, promoting jazz through music, you know, in a way to combat Soviet propaganda. And you've got like a museum or an event? I so we have photographs showing them there, and they're in the Diplomacy Center at that 21st Street entrance. If you leave today, I mean, I just walked through, so a lot of the photographs are already up, um, but we're happy to give you a tour if you wanted to do a story sure. on it. Please do contact us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Have you had this jazz diplomacy taking place anywhere else? I'm sorry, in the exhibit? No, no, in other parts. In other areas, in other countries? Oh, I see. Um, I don't know if you can, if we can be in contact with us, I can give you an exact list of countries that the museum's visited. I know, for instance, there's a very famous photograph of Louis Armstrong sitting on a camel when he was in Egypt. Yeah, it's a great photo. It's an awesome photo. But I can find that information out for you. All right. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Obviously, I can contact you if I want to tour as a journalist, but if I'm just a tourist, when do I come? I'm just wondering to see, can members of the public? Uh, to the in? event tomorrow or for to see jazz diplomacy? To see jazz diplomacy or the, the African American. Accident. Because we're not fully open to the public yet, we're asking that the public um, contact us via our website so that we know that they're coming in. Yeah, so it's mostly just groups What's that we're doing now. Uh, our website is diplomacycenter.state.gov. Um, the event is tomorrow about African American diplomats. Yes, it's a one day event. Jazz diplomacy will be up for about two months. Excellent. We look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Bye. And we get a lot more questions from these all about you than we do about oh, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> some of the uh, more dramatic things in the world. Thank you so much, Doctor. We sure appreciate it. Uh, if anybody has any additional questions or needs any information about, uh, of the event, time, et cetera, please uh, just let us know. We're happy to help you out. But um, love to have the opportunity to bring you some of our experts here. Uh, a few announcements I'd like to start off with before taking your questions today. And uh, the first starts in Pakistan, uh, where we'd like to say that we'd like to join the government of Pakistan and others around the world in mourning the passing of a Pakistani human rights and democracy advocate. Her name was Asma Jahanjar. Uh, for years, Ms. Jahanjar courageously defended the rights of those who did not have a voice. She championed the rule of law, democracy, and human rights around the world, including in Iran. As a global icon in human rights, she founded and chaired the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan. She served as the president of the Supreme Court Bar Association. Most recently, she served as UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Iran, tirelessly fighting on behalf of the Iranian people as they demanded freedom, dignity, and human rights. Her passing is a great loss to the world, and she will be missed as a champion in her country, its people, and millions more around the world. Uh, secondly, I'd like to bring to your attention something that's coming from our INL Bureau. Uh, they handle drugs and all that stuff. Um, and as a part of U.S. efforts to bolter Central America's fight against transnational crime, the State Department and the U.S. Coast Guard partnered to refurbish and donate two Coast Guard cutters to the Costa Rican Coast Guard. U.S. and Costa Rican officials are commemorating the partnership today in Baltimore, Maryland, where the Costa Rican Coast Guard is now receiving 10 weeks of training with the U.S. Coast Guard. The cutters will provide Costa Rica with its ability to effectively patrol to the full extent its Pacific waters, a prominent transit zone for illicit drugs coming to the United States. Costa Rica ranks as the second highest in the Western Hemisphere for transshipment of cocaine following the country of Mexico. Through the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, INL, 
and the Bureau of Political Military Affairs, the State Department partners with Costa Rica to improve border security, strengthen rule of law, and also fight transnational crime. Uh, next, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Secretary's uh, trip in the Middle East. Uh, earlier today, Secretary Tillerson attended a minister-level meeting of the Coalition to Defeat ISIS. This took place in Kuwait. The coalition now continues to grow, and we welcome its newest member today, the Philippines, which has now become the 75th member of the de-ISIS coalition. The secretary discussed the incredible progress that has been made in the fight against ISIS, but he also emphasized how the fight is not over. The secretary was pleased to announce that the United States intends to provide nearly $200 million in additional funding to further support critical stabilization and early recovery initiatives in areas liberated by ISIS from ISIS in Syria. He proudly noted that 98 percent of the territory once held by ISIS in Iraq and Syria has now been liberated. Approximately 4.5 million Iraqis and 3.2 million Syrians have now been freed. The fact that ISIS still poses a serious threat to our homeland and other parts of the globe cannot be stressed enough. The fight against ISIS has evolved, and now so has the coalition. We welcome the Philippines. And then finally, um, as many of you know, the Secretary took part in an Iraq Reconstruction Conference uh, just a short while ago. That conference uh, seeks to bring together the donor community, civil society, and the private sector to help address Iraq address its reconstruction needs following the devastation from ISIS. It's a three-day forum to showcase private sector investment opportunities, and it also serves to generate interest about Iraq as a good business and investment opportunity. At the event today, the Secretary was pleased to announce that the United States is committed to supporting the U.S. private sector in Iraq through the work of the Export-Import Bank, XM, and also the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC. To signal its strong commitment, the XM Bank and Iraq's Ministry of Finance will today sign a $3 billion memorandum of understanding. It will set the stage for future cooperation across key sectors of Iraq's economy, including oil and gas, transportation, and also commodities. OPIC, which supports development through a model of investment rather than aid, has five active projects in Iraq totaling $250 million right now. It's currently reviewing more than $500 million worth of new project proposals in Iraq. The projects are helping to increase the supply of affordable housing in the country and helping entrepreneurs and small businesses access financing to start and expand their businesses. This will create jobs and opportunity in the region. As the Secretary wraps up his participation in the de-ISIS ministerial and also the Iraq Reconstruction Conference, I want to take a moment to address some of the negative reports on the Iraq Reconstruction Conference that have come out today. The reports mischaracterize the conference as a pledging conference. This was never intended to be a pledging conference. That is a false premise. Uh, the idea is um, to show some of the companies and some of the other countries that are participants in this conference Iraq's plan, which was just uh, rolled out yesterday, its financial plan. Companies and also countries can take that plan home. They can take a look at it and determine what is best for them. So again, this was never intended to be a pledging conference, but rather the initial uh, rollout on behalf of the Iraqi government. The government of Iraq has just rolled out its 10-year reconstruction program. The Iraq government understands, along with experts who work, that these issues uh, within the international community will take years for Iraq to recover from the devastation that was caused by ISIS. ISIS terrorists took a scorched earth approach to their occupation of Iraq. They left behind tens of thousands of IEDs and other explosive devices in homes and schools and hospitals, you name it. This requires a long-term commitment, not just from the United States, we will continue to support that, but from many other countries as well, as we stand shoulder to shoulder with the Iraqi people. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions, and thank you for your patience. Thanks, Heather. Uh, why don't we start in the Middle East? Okay. Um, first of all, just briefly, I imagine you probably don't have a lot on this, but um, does the U.S. have any reaction to the uh, Israeli police recommending that Prime Minister Netanyahu be indicted on corruption and other charges? Um, Thank you. Thank you for that question. The only thing I have to say about that is that the United States has a very strong relationship not only with uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, but also the Israeli government. Uh, we're certainly aware of it, but we consider it to be an eternal Israeli matter. And then uh, the Palestinians over the last few days seem to have uh, slightly walked back their earlier declaration that the U.S. was disqualified as a mediator in this. They're now suggesting the U.S. can't be the only mediator, but that maybe if there were some type of expanded quartet situation with other countries involved that the U.S. could retain some role in that. Um, is the U.S. 
um, uh, open to being only one of a number of uh, folks trying to uh, mediate the resolution the president's you, talked about? You know, this is a policy priority for the president and this administration. I think the ultimate goal that we'd like to see is peace in the Middle East. Um, part of that will be resolved, or a big part of that will be resolved, through the Israelis and the Palestinians sitting down to have, together to have a conversation. I think if other countries can encourage that to happen, that that would certainly be helpful, but I'm not aware of any uh, specific proposals, so I would hesitate to comment on that further. What about the role of the, the Russians vis-a-vis -vis Israel right now? I mean, it seems like, you know, Putin has been pushing Netanyahu to, to back off on some of you know, the r recent uh, Israeli actions in Syria. I mean, are, are you concerned that, that we may be ceding some leverage with Israel to Russia like we have in Syria? You know, I, I feel like this question comes up a lot, how we feel about Russia trying to have uh, better relations, stronger relations, or brand new relations with another country. I'm fully confident, and this government is fully confident in its uh, relationship with Israel, uh, with the government of Israel, and with the prime minister, and I don't think that anything's going to come between our relationship and the Israeli government's. Yeah. Uh, uh, certainly. Well, you have a framework, it's the quartet. I mean, the quartet is Russia, the United States, uh, the European Union and the United Nations. So there is a framework to negotiate a, a settlement. So it's there. What did you comment on that? Look, I, I would just say, Saeed, I'm not going to get ahead of any potential uh, new types of negotiations or phone calls or meetings that may come into play. Okay. Let me ask you on the settlement issue mm -hmm. a couple of questions. Sure. Yesterday, the, the White House denied that they were in talks with, the, with Mr. Netanyahu over the annexation of the settlement blocks. Uh, very strongly denied it. Uh, but other than that, this administration has not really condemned or, you know, taken a very strong position against settlement building. I mean, we have seen in the last few days, just allow me for a second, for, for the last few days, we have seen building expansion settlements outside Naples. Uh, then today, the Israeli Knesset basically extended civil law over academic institutions inside the settlements, which basically makes them part of Israel, and it's mm -hmm. like annexation uh, by I'm, other means. I'm not aware of the last point that you brought mm -hmm. up, but, but we have been very clear about this, that um, additional settlement activity, unrestrained settlement activity, does not advance the prospect for peace. We've also had numerous conversations with the government of Israel where the government is, of Israel has said that it would take into consideration before making decisions the president's concern about unrestrained settlement activity. So we've talked about that a lot. Uh, we've covered that quite a bit, and so I think we've been clear about that. So you would oppose any measures that would be annexation by other means, like extending uh, civil law over institutions in the settlement? I, I can be clear and very clear about this, that the idea of what you just mentioned is not something that came up between the U.S. and the government of Israel. And I promise one last one. There is a, a Palestinian teenager, Ahed Tamimi, who is today was brought for a military court. Nobody knows what's going on behind closed doors. She's there because she slapped an Israeli soldier who was raiding her home in the middle of the night back in December. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly aware of that report. Uh, many of us here at the State Department are. I would say we're always concerned about the use of force, about any credible, credible reports of excessive use of force. Uh, all individuals, especially children, should be treated humanely and with respect and in accordance to law. Would okay. you call on the Israeli to let her go? Look, I, I'm not going to get in the middle of what is going on over there with regard to this, but uh, just let me make it clear one more time. We are always concerned about uh, excessive use of force, about reports of excessive use of force, uh, especially as it pertains to children. Okay? All right. Shall we move on? Yes, yeah, just to follow up oh, on uh, not so on the Tamimi case, but broad, more broadly on Israel. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the, the White House has taken the lead on the Israeli Palestinian peace process, but there's a lot of other elements to the U.S. alliance with Israel. In particular, Israel is very deeply implicated in what's going on in Syria. Why isn't Secretary Tillerson going to make a stop in Jerusalem mm -hmm. during this trip in the Middle East? Look, uh, putting together these trips is very complicated. You have to pull together a lot of different people's schedules at the same time and make sure that they are completely in sync. As you well know, we have a very strong relationship with Israel. We have a lot strong relationship with the Israeli people and the government of Israel. There is no question about that. The secretary had a 21-minute phone call with the prime minister on Saturday, not long after we learned about the incident that happened with the uh, Israeli jet. Um, I kind of liken that to my relationship with my best friend from junior high school, Julie.
She lives in the Midwest. Every time I go to the Midwest, I don't get to see my friend Julie. Every time the Secretary Tillerson is going to go to the Middle East, he's not going to be able to hit every single country. But there is no doubt in the mind of the Israeli government officials or our government officials that our bond is strong. And had uh, the Prime Minister asked Secretary Tillerson to join him there, which he never did, uh, I imagine if our schedules coincided that we would have done that. But we were not asked to do so. Okay. Uh, any other questions related to this? Um, okay, Lori, go right ahead. Um, yesterday, a senior State Department official told reporters that Iraqi Prime Minister Abadi would disband the popular mobilization forces, yet the deputy commander of those forces, Abu Mekdi al mohandis who was a terrorist involved in the 1983 bombings of the U.S. and French embassies in Kuwait, has vowed not to do so. Do you really believe that Abadi has the will and ability to disband the popular mobilization forces? Uh, first, let me say that uh, Secretary Tillerson in his meetings in Kuwait today spent a little bit of time uh, with Prime Minister Abadi. I can give you a partial readout of that uh, in just a minute if you'd like that. Uh, let me address your question, though, first. We have every confidence in the Prime Minister of Iraq. He has clearly demonstrated not only his leadership, he's demonstrated his capability, his competence, and his ability uh, in our shared fight against ISIS. Uh, I just want to be very, very clear about that. Uh, the PMF, by law, are supposed to be under uh, the governance of the Prime Minister of Iraq and falling under uh, the central government of Iraq. There are some what we would call undisciplined, undisciplined PMF forces that aren't always following the rules, and that's a tremendous concern of ours. So we certainly acknowledge that. All armed actors should operate within Iraq's uh, state security framework and answer to the Prime Minister. We hope they will. Okay. So, but the senior State Department official in the transcript that you put out said that these forces, they would either be incorporated into the Iraqi army or that they would go home as if the stru PMF structures would no longer exist. Mm. Do I understand correctly? I, I, I'm not sure I'd have to dig down further into the details on that of what, our, um, what my colleague meant by that exactly. Okay, uh, okay hold on one second. I just want to try to find, uh, Lori, the readout of that because the Secretary had quite a few pull asides. If you all are interested in any specific country, I can certainly provide you that. Uh, okay, so the Secretary actually uh, sat down for a bilat with uh, Prime Minister Abadi, and uh, it's a little lengthy, so let me just read this to you. After participating in the defeat ISIS ministerial in Kuwait, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson met with Prime Minister of Iraq. The Secretary congratulated Prime Minister Abadi and the Iraqi people on the retaking of all territory previously held by ISIS and acknowledged their sacrifices in the shared fight against ISIS. The Secretary expressed his support for a unified, democratic, federal, and prosperous Iraq and a stable and viable Iraqi Kurdistan region as part of the Iraqi state. He commended the Prime Minister for his leadership and for its efforts to improve the baghdad Erbil relations. The leaders discussed ways to accelerate the critical work of stabilization and help bring millions of displaced Iraqis safely back home. Both recognized that Iraq is at an important juncture in its history. They discussed the U.S.-Iraq relations in the post-ISIS era and the important role that the Strategic Framework Agreement will play to strengthen and deepen our strategic cooperation with Iraq, especially in the areas of trade and finance. Finally, the Secretary conveyed that the Iraq Reconstruction Conference would provide an important opportunity for the government of Iraq to showcase attractive investment opportunities for foreign investors, including many American companies, and to de demonstrate, in the Secretary's words, that Iraq is open for business. Okay. Hi. Hi. Barbara. Uh, Heather, has the U.S. asked Britain to take back the two British ISIS members that the Kurds have captured? I, uh, not that I am aware of, but I, if I recall correctly, I think, I think the Brits took away their citizenship, uh, if I recall correctly. So I'm not sure where that leaves them in terms of status. I can see if I can find out uh, something more for you. That, however, might be something uh, that falls under the Department of Defense. Yes, because the administration seems to have made it pretty clear it wants countries of origin to repatriate and try or, or deal uh, with them. I know that but Secretary Mattis was talking about that today. I've not had a chance to review Secretary Mattis's comments, so I don't want to step on anything that he potentially said or uh, uh, change that. Do you know whether like. it's an area of contention? Uh, uh, not that I'm aware of, but I, again, I can look into this and try to get you some information on that. Okay. Uh, where would you like to go next? Hi. Go ahead. Ahead. Uh, 
I want to Pardon me. Pakistan. Oh. Me these. Uh, Pakistan has recently made an amendment in its law to automatically add individuals and groups sanctions by the UN Security Council as banned in the country. And this comes after a U.S. push to add Pakistan on a global terrorism finance a watchdog list. Would the U.S. consider taking back its motion or softening its stance now that Pakistan is also changing its? Yeah, Cindy, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I'll, let me look into that. No, not at all. Let me uh, look into that for you. Uh, Connor, hi. Yeah. Um, so uh, Senator Baldwin of Wisconsin has sent a letter to the secretary about these cases of tainted alcohol mm -hmm. in Mexico. Uh, in her letter, she says that the State Department is creating a process for collecting and analyzing over 140 U.S. citizens' stories of uh, experiences, either injuries or deaths due to tainted alcohol. Can you confirm whether or not you guys have received the letter and whether or not you have set up such a process? Sure. Uh, this is a story we've talked about uh, for quite a few months now. I recall we first spoke about it, I think it was during spring break or sometime last summer when we first started receiving reports about American citizens who uh, were concerned or thought that they might have uh, been sickened by what we call tainted or unregulated alcohol in Mexico. That is a tremendous concern on the part of the U.S. government. The safety and security of our U.S. citizens as they're traveling overseas is one of our very top issues. Uh, we have received Senator Baldwin's letter. We are reviewing that letter and we'll respond to that appropriately. We have uh, the State Department 17 reports from individuals who have uh, shared their concerns, their belief that they may have uh, experienced or suffered from tainted or unregulated alcohol. That's the number that the State Department has, 17. I want to be clear to everyone who may be traveling uh, to Mexico at some point, you know, if something were to occur where you feel that you have come in contact with this, please contact the State Department. You all have heard us before. You can contact our embassy, and we take in some of those reports. We are not able to prosecute because it is not our country. That's up to the Mexican government uh, to do that, but we're able to at least track some of the reports. Uh, this is also a good reminder for Americans who are traveling overseas, whether it be Mexico or any other country, to sign up on our State Department website for our STEP program. Uh, you can go to travel.state.gov for that information. Uh, that enables you to put in your phone number, put in your email address. So in the case of an emergency, if something uh, were to happen, we needed to reach American citizens to help them in some sort of way. That is how we would reach them. In her letter, I know you said you obviously can't prosecute cases in Mexico, yeah. but but the senator says she believes there is a systemic there are systemic issues related to not only illicit alcohol but uh, weak and corrupt law enforcement and judicial judicial institutions, an absence of the rule of law, and an overall dangerous environment for U.S. citizens in Mexico. Is that a view that the State Department shares? There is information on our website about the uh, safety levels of different states in Mexico. It varies, so I don't want to uh, paint everything with one broad brush stroke. That's why I would encourage anyone who's interested in traveling uh, to take a look at that. The vast majority of Mexico is safe. There are some spots where uh, we've been very clear that can be dangerous, and that's why we would encourage you to go to the website, look at those specific regions, and learn more about where you intend to go. Okay, just have one last sure. question on this. Uh, she also calls on the State Department to actually do more for Americans who have been affected. Are there any, you know, ongoing analysis or investigations about what more the State Department could do, whether or not you have maybe not done enough in the past? Look, I, I think we have always and often said this, that the safety and security of Americans is our top issue. Uh, we are collecting this information. We are gathering some of those reports. Uh, we represent Americans and assist Americans when they are overseas. We would urge somebody, if they were sick, not only to contact our embassy, but to seek me immediate medical attention if they feel that they have been affected by this. Okay. We have a turkey Yeah, sure. Um, so um, you all have been urging, uh, really pleading with the, the, the Turkish government not to move their operation eastward from a friend towards uh, Manbij, in response to um, you know some of those calls from the U.S., uh, President Erdogan said uh, to those who say if they hit us, we will respond with force. It is clear that they have never experienced the Ottoman slap. So I guess first of all, has the U.S. experienced the Ottoman slap? I mean, do you know what he, what he's referring to? Do you have any thoughts on you know? I mean, this is a relevant question because it speaks to just the really dire situation between. The U.S. and this NATO ally, Tillerson, is going to be there in a few days. Certainly. Uh, as you all know, Secretary Tillerson is going to Turkey, and that's where he will be meeting with our counterpart. 
we have had a series of high-level meetings with the Turkish government about our concerns about es the escalation of violence in Syria, in particular in the Afrin area, which, by the way, we are not operating, but nonetheless, it is a concern of ours. I think the Secretary has been very clear uh, with President Erdogan about our concerns, about uh, their very legitimate security concerns. We understand that Turkey, our NATO ally, has legitimate security concerns from some operating in parts of Syria. We understand that. We would like to be able to speak with them about what would be a, a solution that would work uh, not only for them, but for those in Syria and the United States and others as well. I don't want to get ahead of some of the Secretary's conversations. And um, mm -hmm. as, as funny as the comment was that you explained to me, I, I'm not going to respond to every uh, foreign leader's comment, if, if you understand that. Okay? Uh, we, we can stick more on uh, Turkey. Does that yeah, I mean, I guess I mean, to your point, we you said you've been talking with them about ways to address. I mean, it was, uh, you know, several weeks ago when when they started their operation that, you know, we were talking about some type of joint arrangement to, you know, uh, have some stability in that part of northern Syria. Mm -hmm. I mean, has there been any progress in that? Have you been meeting with them on well, it? Well, I think I think the one of the bigger ways that we are making progress is that the Secretary is going there to Turkey himself. I think that shows just how serious uh, this matter is and how seriously regarded. Uh, General McMaster was talking with them not too long ago. I know we've had many of our experts who are there on the ground having daily engagement with the Turkish government about this matter. Um, this is one of the areas of deep, deep concern on the part of the administration and the U.S. government. We certainly don't want to see things uh, further uh, violence further escalate there. So we're watching it very carefully, but I'm not going to get ahead of some of the Secretary's meetings that he's going to have. Do you have any objection to the Turks uh, renaming the street on which our embassy is located to the name of the military operation that we wish that they were not doing? I heard that. I also heard that Russia was thinking about doing the same thing. I think that would be largely an internal matter. If a city decides it wants to rename a street something, especially in Turkey or Russia, where we support freedom of speech, they can call it whatever they want as long as it's in accordance with their own law. We're fine with that. Okay, let's uh, let, hold on. Let's stick with Turkey here before we go on anywhere else. Uh, Dave, hold on. Then we'll go to Ilhan. Okay, go. Thank you. There are reports that uh, in Turkey there is another U.S. consulate worker arrested in recent weeks and he has been under house arrest for weeks now. Do you have any information on that? Have you been? I, I'm certainly aware of the situation. I don't have any information that I can give you on that at this time. Uh, one more, okay, one more question. Yes. Secretary Tillerson a couple of weeks ago denied that there are uh, no work on uh, to create border guards in Syria. Yesterday, Pentagon budget revealed that there are about 200 million uh, millions of dollars will be spent on the train and equip Syrian uh, border uh, guards. Can you explain that? Are you trying to create these forces or not? I, I can tell you I had a heck of a time getting through the State Department budget. I certainly haven't read the Department of Defense's budget. I know they have a briefing on Thursday, so I'd encourage you to uh, reach out to the Department of Defense to find out exactly what is in, what is in their budget. Uh, I know we have tremendous security concerns about eastern Syria in particular. Uh, where we are working with coalition partners to help prevent ISIS from coming back in and to eventually allow people to be able to go back into their homes where it's safe enough to do so. Uh, Dave, you had something on Turkey, too. Yeah. In your response to Josh's question, you said yeah. that the United States is very concerned about the rising levels of violence in mm -hmm. Afrin, mm -hmm. um, and you brought that up with the Turks. But do you, are you, to go to the heart of his question, I, I suppose, are you also concerned about the rising anti-American rhetoric from the Turkish government? Okay, I think we're used to that kind of rhetoric, whether it's from the Turkish government or from other governments. And so that's why we don't get too riled up about that. We hear other governments, other foreign leaders say things about us, uh, post things about us on social media, all of that. It's not going to get us riled up. We're sticking to the policy. But most of the other countries that criticize you in these terms are not your allies. Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're not, we're not going to go there. We're taking the high road. Um, this is something that we recognize that Turkey has legitimate security concerns. Uh, we will talk with our ally about their legitimate security concerns and also our concerns about the escalation of violence. We don't want to see civilians killed. We don't want to see people killed. We don't want to see the fight move away from the fight against ISIS. That needs to be the priority. Secretary Tillerson announcing that $200 million going to Syria to stabilization uh, today. You know, that is so important that we can keep ISIS out, defeat ISIS, keep ISIS out, get people back home. And the last thing we need to do is turn our attention away from ISIS. ISIS and on to something else. I think folks back there want to go home, and that's really what should be 
uh, all about. Uh, Ilhan, if I can go back to you for one uh, for one second, I, I know that you have asked me often in the past, not not very recently, but about uh, one of your members of Parliament, uh, Mr. Barbulio. Yes. Yeah. Um, so old, yes. I, if you're interested in that, I have a little update. Would be great. Okay, Thank I have you. an update for you. Um, there have been a, uh, quite a few media reports out about uh, this member of parliament. His name is Ennis uh, Bur Burbulio. Barbaro. Barbo. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's we consider it to be a, a complex case. Uh, we remain seriously concerned about the widespread arrest and pretrial detention in Turkey on a range of individuals who are critical of the Turkish government. He was one who was considered to be critical of the Turkish government. So we want to take this opportunity to remind the government of Turkey that freedom of expression, including freedom of speech, uh, freedom for the media to operate, I know our Turkish reporters care uh, very deeply about that, uh, freedom of speech, including times when that speech can become very uncomfortable uh, for a government or a regime, that needs to be protected, that freedom of speech. More voices, not fewer voices, are necessary in some of these challenging times. We want to urge Turkey to respect and ensure freedom of the press, fair trial guarantees, judicial independence, and other human rights and fundamental freedoms. So uh, Ilhan, I know you've taken an interest in that. You haven't Thank asked you. me about it for a while, but I had some new you. info, so I want to bring it up. Okay, go right ahead. I wanted to ask if you had any updates on Andrew Brunson. He's an American imprisoned yes. in Turkey, or any message. Uh, the last time he was able to see consular staff and any message to the Turks in advance of the secretary's visit there on him. Uh, you're referring to Pastor uh, Brunson. He's an American citizen. He's been detained in Turkey well over a year now. I believe it's... Um, goodness, then uh, closer to the year and a half, I believe. Uh, Secretary Tillerson, um, this is an issue that is important to him. I know that he has brought it up with the government. I know that the vice president and the president have uh, in the past brought up that issue as well. Uh, Pastor Brunson, the last three dates that I have for him in which he was able to be seen by U.S. officials was August the 24th, 2017. He was seen by uh, some of our embassy colleagues on September the 18th of 2017. And we just saw him on February the 6th of 2018. So that was the last time that we were able to visit him. Uh, those are our consular uh, officers, actually, who were able to see him. So we continue to provide appropriate consular services both to Mr. Brunson and his family. But I'd have to refer you to his attorney for any questions about the specific case. Okay. All right. Anything else in turn? Okay. All right. Let's let's move on ahead to uh, Syria. Let's, okay. Hold on. Let's go ahead on. Just go. <laughs> Cuba, we'll take Cuba. <laughs> I, regarding the budget. Yes. Um, the assistance given to human rights and pro-democracy groups, supporting <laughs> human rights and pro-democracy groups within Cuba, has been halved from 20 to 10 million in this proposal for the budget, given the... Um, the treatment of, for example, religious people in Cuba, the persecution, the increase in harassment to religious groups, etc. How how can you? Um, what is the judgment made to be to to have that type of assistance mm -hmm. to the human rights well, groups? I think as we look at putting the budget together, uh, and our numbers come from OMB, and then we negotiate and work with Congress. So we're not at an end point. We're at sort of a middle to a starting point phase right now as we look at our at our overall budget. Um, as it pertains to Cuba, to your question, last year for the year uh, 2018, right now we're looking at the budget for 2019. So last year for 2018, it was actually zero for democracy promotion in Cuba. The president then undertook his Cuba policy review and made some changes about how this government views the government of Cuba and how we want to handle our relations with Cuba. This year, we've come with the uh, number of $10 million for democracy promotion. So up significantly from zero last year. Okay? So when, okay. Not, when, when we were discussing the, um, the, the Cubans have raised some complaints about the uh, Cuba Internet Task Force that mm -hmm. held a meeting here recently. Uh, you know, saying that basically the, the State Department is trying to subvert Cuba's government. I think you called that ridiculous and maybe ludicrous, but I mean, if we have money built into our budget to promote a different system of government in a country than what the system they currently have, I mean, how can, how can 
you say that you know that's not well, attempt to subvert their government. The, uh, the Internet Task Force that you're talking about was a pulled together group uh, sponsored here at the State Department of a group of NGOs, but also people from the private sector, because we believe that the Cuban people should have free and full and unfettered access to the Internet. They don't. It's cost prohibitive in many places. People don't have the access that a government should give them. So we're doing what we can with the budget that we have and determining where we can best use our resources. And uh, some folks putting that together felt that that was the right dollar amount for that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Afghanistan. Let's go right ahead. Heather, there was a report that Russia and Iran claimed that uh, the U.S. is sending Daesh militants from the Middle East to Afghanistan to destabilize the region. That, was that we are. That, okay. That's what this is. All right. No, no, absolutely not. Um, however, I can tell you that in Secretary's de-ISIS coalition ministerial, it's not the Secretary's, it's the coalition uh, de-ISIS ministerial, which contains 75 countries, as they were meeting today, the Secretary and some of the other nations were encouraging the uh, partner states and entities to take a broader look at ISIS. Uh, this coalition was formed together first to um, go after ISIS in both Syria and Iraq. We are now seeing ISIS crop up in other places around the world. You've seen the news reports about terror attacks in other countries. Unfortunately, we are seeing evidence, and the Secretary spoke to this today, of ISIS popping up in places like Afghanistan, uh, in Southeast Asia and other countries. So the coalition is now saying, let's keep the focus on the fight against ISIS in Syria and Iraq, but let's also uh, keep an eye on ISIS popping up elsewhere so that we don't have even more of a global threat so we can try to contain that. But is the U.S. responsible? Absolutely not. Mm. Okay. North Korea. All right. Okay, North Korea. Um, so there was a report that Pence has, um, th there was his kind of interview with Josh Rogan in the um, Washington Post. So just questions about um, potential talks with North Korea. Um, is the U.S. ready to talk with North Korea without precondition? And then um, if there are preconditions, what would those be? Yeah. So let me lay this out. Uh, the vice president, in just having made his uh, trip to uh, South Korea and also to Japan, uh, to not only stand with our allies, but also uh, to celebrate with our Olympians. And by the way, Chloe came last night. How great was she? Aren't these girls amazing, what they can do on the snowboards? So uh, we're certainly cheering them on, and I know the vice president uh, was as well. Uh, in regard to the DPRK, uh, let me just reiterate something that the vice president had said. The pressure does not come off until they are actually doing something that the alliance believes represents a meaningful step toward denuclearization. The maximum pressure campaign is going to continue and intensify, but if you want to talk, we'll talk. He also said maximum pressure and engagement can be done at the same time. So I hope that is clear. Um, we remain in close contact with uh, the Republic of Korea. They are a close ally of ours. We are in lockstep with the Republic of Korea as we are with Japan on these matters. At some point, we may sit down and talk. It has to be about we are willing to get to the point of nuclear denuclearization. It's not at that point just yet. Okay. Anything else? Anything else on North Korea? Anything else on North Korea? Yeah. Korea, yeah. Korea. Okay. Sorry. Korea. North Korea. 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 Hey, how you doing? So you said that. So it seems to be a change in our policy because you've said many times before we're not going to talk to them at all until denuclearization is on the table. Mm -hmm. So how does that? Is that a change? No. No. I think I think part of the conversation is look to realize the to be able to set the agenda for what you're going to talk about, and that would be denuclearization, you may have to have a preliminary chat about what that discussion would look like. But wasn't it before you saying no chats at all? I think we've always been clear about our policy of denuclearization, and that has not changed, and we hope to be able to get there. And it's not just our policy, it's many other countries' policies as well. Hey, Michelle. I have a quick follow-up to where we began this oh. uh, conversation on the Netanyahu question. Okay, can, I, can we come back to that so we can stick with the issue of North Korea and everything before we move on to something else? Hey, how are you? Um, on the comment that Pence made on maximum pressure and engagement at the same time, mm -hmm. can you walk us through what that would look like? Well, as you well know, we don't, uh, we don't forecast sanctions. Uh, the Vice President mentioned that there may be sanctions coming forward. Maximum pressure is something that is the key part of our, um, of our policy with regard to North Korea. Uh, we just noticed today that Malaysia government said it would take more steps 
to uh, work to cut ties with North Korea. Thank you, Malaysia, for doing that. That is just the latest in uh, another of many countries that has cooperated or has agreed to cooperate with the world, with many other countries, to uh, put that maximum pressure on North Korea. In terms of forecasting any additional sanctions, I'm just not going to go any further than that, but that's something that we're always uh, consistently looking at. But what about the engagement portion of that? I think I, think I addressed that already. Okay. Okay. Hi. Hi. How does the State Department view South Korean President Moon Jae-in's mediating role between the United States and North Korea to start talks? You know, as I said just a minute ago, we have an ironclad relationship with uh, with President Moon, but not only with President Moon, also um, with uh, Japan as well. Uh, I'd like to read for you a quote from him in which he consistently will say himself that denuclearization has to be the goal. Uh, I don't have it in front of me right now, but he's uh, he's been very consistent about saying that. So we're on the same page and we're very closely linked up with the Republic of Korea. Okay, I'll take one more question on Egypt and then we gotta go. Uh, who had Egypt? Who had Egypt? Egypt okay, you two, both, both of you. Okay, go ahead, okay. sir. What's your uh, name? Uh, Mohammed Al Ahmed from Al Jazeera. Uh, hi, Mohammed. Yeah, hi. Uh, so uh, today, the Egyptian authorities arrested the prominent former anti-corruption uh, chief Hisham Jinina, who was in charge of the elections campaign of the former military chief of staff Sami Anan, who was arrested as well. Do you have any comment on on that? And also, there was a sort of criticism uh, towards Secretary Tillerson's uh, because uh, of uh, his, uh, because uh, the issue of human rights abuses and violations in, in Egypt were not top uh, priorities during his meetings with, uh, with Egyptian uh, officials. How do you respond to yeah, that? First, I would dispute that characterization. Uh, Secretary Tillerson, in this, his meetings with his counterparts and also with President Sisi, brought up issues of human rights. He brought up issues of detention. He brought up the importance of holding free and fair elections where everyone is free and able to participate if they wish to do so. That is something that we discuss with the Egyptians. That's something that we discuss with many other countries around the world. The fact that we discuss it with other countries around the world does not make it less important in the country of Egypt. Uh, as you all know, our Vice President was there not too long ago in which he held meetings uh, with uh, top Egyptian officials and talked about the NGO law in Egypt, which, which is tremendously concerning to the United States. Uh, I know Secretary Tillerson and the Vice President share an incredible level of concern with regard to uh, some of the terror actions that have taken place, not only at mosques, uh, but also in Christian churches and other places of worship uh, in Egypt. That's something that they've kept a very close eye on and are tremendously concerned about. Uh, Secretary Tillerson, when he met with the Egyptians here in Washington not that long ago, also talked about the issue of ISIS and the fight against ISIS. And I can assure you that when you have that many lives at stake with the fight against ISIS, that may very well be the top issue, regional stability, and the safety and security of civilians all around uh, that part of the world, but also uh, in Syria and Iraq. Elections, I can reassure you, were an important part of the Secretary's conversations in Egypt. And what about the arrest of the former chief? Uh, that is uh, Hasham Janina. Janina, thank you. Uh, he was the former head of an anti-corruption right? exactly. Ent entity there, right? Uh, we're following that case closely. We're certainly aware of that. Um, we support a transparent and credible process in, with regard to uh, the electoral process, and that's one of the reasons why the Secretary spoke about the importance of uh, having full, unfettered access to, to the polls so that people can vote. And okay. speaking the same on, on Egypt and North Korea, it seems that North Korea was uh, uh, on the top of Secretary Tillerson's agenda. That is something we discuss with many Egyptian. countries around the world when we meet with them. Uh, that N North Korea was certainly something that came up as well. Not about the ties between Egypt and North Korea, did Secretary Tillerson receive any promises to severe ties between I don't Egypt? have any specific information on any assurances that were provided, but I just know that that issue came up. We raised that issue with many countries around the world. Okay. And I'm going to have to go, but Michelle, I want to take your last question. Quick question. On the, I know you said the Netanyahu matter was an internal matter, but it does involve this building. The Israeli police are saying they're looking into Netanyahu's 
contacts with John Kerry and the former ambassador over uh -huh. a visa issue. Okay. Um, so I wonder if this building is cooperating at all in the investigation. This is the first I'm hearing about it. I don't know if notification was sent to the State Department or if so, when, but we can certainly look at it. I don't know if I'll have anything for you, though, on that right away. Thank you. Okay. And, sir, you were, I'm going to take your last question because, sure. yeah. Just tell me your name and you're from where? My name is Amr. I work for an affiliate channel with Al Jazeera Arabic. Okay. That's a follow-up on uh, on Egypt as well. Okay. Uh, today, 14... Uh, Sorry, internet... Robert. I know we're, we're over on time. We just... Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Robert. Had to be in shortly. <laughs> we have two new faces here, so... So, uh, we have 14 uh, international organizations that have condemned the presidential elections and called it not fair, not free, and they called specifically the U.S. and the European Union to take actions against the Egyptian uh, president. Mm. Uh, among these organizations is Human Rights Watch. Do you believe that the U.S. is going to take any action in this I, regard? I don't know what kind of action we would take. Um, I think the secretary... They specifically mentioned halting the, uh, the aid. The, uh, I'm not aware of any plans to look at, at, at doing that. I know the secretary made it a priority to talk about our concerns uh, in the election. Uh, a week or so ago, we spoke about uh, your former uh, equivalent to our chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, who had been detained. So, yeah, it's something we're certainly familiar with and we're watching closely. Okay, thanks everybody.